So when we start off EKGs, um, you know, the first thing I always look for is you want to look and see where you find, can find healings, right? So you look and see if it's sinus rhythm or not. So sinus rhythm, if you, if you have sinus rhythm, it comes from the right atrium. So when you look at EKG leads, I'm going to give you the way I look at them. I look at the leads in, in a bunch. So 2, 3, and ABF are what we call our limb leads or, or inferior leads, okay? So just remember it that way. 2, 3, ABF are your inferior leads because they face towards the bottom. So if, if electricity goes in the heart from top to bottom, it's going to look positive in those leads. So any, when electricity travels towards a certain lead, it's going to have a positive width. When it travels away from it, it's going to have a negative width. That's how, that's how you know what's coming from where. So 2, 3, and ABF, if you have P waves that are positive, see that, that's positive, that's positive. That means it's coming from top to bottom. So right atrium going down to the, going this way, okay? Now, 1 and ABL are your left sided leads. ABL is all the way up, 1 is up here. So 1 and ABL are your left sided leads. So sinus rhythm, you're going to see electricity going from the right atrium to the left atrium. So it's going to be positive in 1 and ABL, depending on where you put the lead. So you can see the, the P waves are positive in 1 and ABL. So that's how you know it's sinus rhythm. So if it is positive in the inferior leads, positive in 1 and ABL, more than likely it is sinus rhythm. Okay? So I always start off with, with looking at where, what rhythm it is. is there, where are the P waves coming from? Now then you look and see if there is a QRS for every P wave. Are we missing QRSs? Are we missing P waves? Are, we, are there extra QRSs? Is there a one-to-one -one relationship? Okay? So that's where you start with your rhythm. <coughs> then you look at your rate. And the easiest way, I'm sure you all know the rate. So the, you start off with one QRS. You have 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 40. That's how you count. So you take two QRSs, put it up here. So that's almost 300, 150, 100, probably about 80 beats a minute in this patient, average. And really, I mean, nobody cares between 81 and 85. It's just, you know, you're, you're kind of looking at a rounded figure. So this is probably a, you know, so if you think of it, that's 300, 150, 100, and there's a little bit extra in there. So 85 beats a minute or so, okay? That's your rate, rhythm. Um, then we look at intervals. And always go step by step, because otherwise you will miss stuff. You have to go step by step. You can't go for the obvious. Um, the first interval that we look for is a PR interval. Okay, that's the beginning of the P to the beginning of the QRS. Okay, normally it's three small small blocks. So when I say three small blocks, it's one, two, three. Okay, three small blocks, which is 120 milliseconds. If it's shorter than if it's shorter than one block, which is 40 milliseconds, if it's shorter than that, then you're talking about other conditions. Or if it's longer, then you're talking about heart block and things like that. So normal PR is anywhere from three blocks to five blocks, so 120 to 200. So anywhere from three to five blocks is what your normal PR interval should be. Normal QRS is anywhere from 80 to 120, which is two small blocks to three small blocks. It's the easiest way to look at it. It's two small to three small blocks, so 80 to 120 milliseconds. The next interval is QT, which is beginning of the Q to the end of the T, okay? And the easiest way to see if QT is long is by putting the beginning of, beginning of your Q, beginning of T, put it right there. If that, that interval is, long, is longer than half of the RR interval, am I being clear? So you take half the RR interval, and if that interval, your QT interval, is longer than half of the RR interval, then your QT is more than likely to be long. Okay, so you can kind of average it up. So that's your QT interval, and once you look at the intervals and you're looking at hypertrophy, so there are a couple ways we look at hypertrophy as, as we go along, I'll, I'll tell you. But you can look at left atrial hypertrophy, right atrial hypertrophy, looking at the size and the dimension of the P waves. You can look at, look at ventricular hypertrophy by looking at the size and dimension of the QRS waves. And then we look for STT wave changes. When you look at STT wave changes, there's only two kind of changes you're looking for. You're either looking for ST elevations or ST depressions. ST elevation tells you there's injury in the heart and it's an acute injury. There is injury happening right then and there. And when you look for ST changes, you always want to look at them in groups. You don't want to look at one, two, three. You don't want to look at it like that. You want to look, them, look at them in groups. 
So the first group I always look for is 2,3-ABF, which is your inferior leads. When you look at these inferior leads, if you have ST elevation, then that, 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 that's inferior ST elevation MI. So when you have ST elevation in the inferior leads, the leads that sit across from the inferior leads are 1 and ABL, which sit right across, okay? So what did I say? If, it, if there's ST elevation that way, when there's injury progressing that way, then you're going to see depression going this way because you're going to see that's what you call reciprocal changes. So when there's ST elevation that way, the leads that sit across from it, you're going to see ST depression because that's what we call the reciprocal changes. So when there's ST elevation in 2, 3 ABF, you are going to see ST depression in 1 and ABL, which is your high lateral leads. Okay? If you don't see ST depression in 1 and ABL, it's probably unlikely you have ST elevation in the inferior leads. Because that's one way. And if there's, if you're questioning it, you really can't see ST elevation here, but there's severe ST depression in just one and ABL, you probably want to look harder in the inferior leads. There might be subtle ST elevation. And sometimes, depending on where the tech puts that lead, you know, you might not pick it up, so you have to be careful about those changes. So, so then you look for one and ABL, which is your lateral leads. So if you have ST elevation in the lateral leads, you're going to have ST depression in the inferior leads, because those are your reciprocal leads. So these two, are reciprocal to these. So you start with your inferior leads, look at your lateral leads, then you move on to what we call the recording leads. Now you have to realize these six leads are in one plane. The, they, are in, they are in this plane. Okay, There's two planes in the heart. There's this plane and there's this plane. So this is the plane. These are the limb leads. The limb leads go in this plane and the V1 through V6 goes in this plane. It's a horizontal plane. This is the vertical plane. This is a horizontal plane. They don't, they're not reciprocal to each other. There's no interaction between the two. So you cannot say there is reciprocal changes in V1, V2 when there's ST elevation here. Because there's nothing reciprocal in here, from here. Because they're two different, different dimensions. They're, they're, they're two different ways that you do it. So you have, this is your horizontal, this is your, this is your vertical, this is your horizontal. So now we move on to are um, horizontal So V1, V2, this is where you put V1 and V2, right? V1 and V2 sit up here. V1 and V2 is where the septum of the heart is. So between, if you think of the right ventricle, the left ventricle, V1 and V2 sit right over the septum. So if you have a C elevation V1, V2, that's septal MI, septal, okay? As you progress along V1, V2, V3, V4 sits up here. That's more anterior left ventricle. So that's where you have your anterior MI. And then as you go to V5, V6, which is more lateral, you get your lateral MI. So if you have ST elevation all the way through, then it's a anterior lateral MI. It's a complete MI. So the higher, you know, if you have septal MI, so if you have ST elevation of V1, V2, it is very proximal in that blood vessel. That's what it says because you're, you're really affecting earlier in the septum because if you think of the LED, the first branches that come out of the LED are going to the septum. So if you're having a septal MI, then the, the clot is way high up in the LED. It's very proximal. Whereas if you're having a lateral MI, then the clot is probably a little more down there. So it depends upon, it's not just the MI part, it's about how much LD is involved. Are they going to go into heart failure? Are they going to have an arrest? You know, things of that sort. So, if you have a very proximal LED, then it's probably more severe than having a distal LED occlusion. Okay, so now these leads never have, as I said, these leads usually don't have a reciprocal change, except for one time. So we don't we don't put leads in the post in the back of the heart, but there's still LV in the back. There's a posterior wall of the left ventricle. We don't put leads on the back of the heart. So we don't have any way to look at the back of the heart except for looking at the front. So now these leads would be reciprocal to the leads in the back, if you think about it. So if you look at lead V1 and V2 and V3, they sit right across from the posterior LV. So if you have ST depression, okay, <coughs> ST depression in V1, V2, V3, that is, that, is, uh, ha, uh, that is equivalent to having ST elevation in your back. So if you have ST depression in V1, V2, V3, that is ST elevation MI in the posterior wall. That's posterior ST elevation MI. And posterior ST elevation MI usually goes along with an inferior ST elevation MI. So if you have ST elevation in inferior leads, you want to look at lead V1 and V2 and V3 to see if you have ST depression in those leads to see if it's inferior MI or just in, or inferior posterior MI. So that's how you would make the difference. 
ABR is a lead by itself. Um, it kind of looks at every lead together. The only time you really see just like entire EKG is normal, and, and the only lead that has less elevation than ABR, then you have to worry about left main. Uh, but then it's not going to be accompanied with anything else. Like the rest of the leads will be normal, and you just have ST elevation just in ABR. And then you really have to worry about left main. That's that's all. Because that lead kind of looks at everything. So you're talking about a, a very global ischemia kind of thing. Um, all right. Go. That's my spiel. Can we start with this? Uh -huh. Okay, well, when you were talking about a lead one being here in ABL, I see a sinus rhythm. Okay, so there is sinus rhythm. So you have positive P waves, and then mm -hmm. for leads, you have positive P waves in um, in lead, lead one and ABL. Mm -hmm. um, and V one, as I said, V one sits um, <laughs> up here. V one also tells you between whether it's right atrium or left atrium. Um, right atrium sits in front of the uh, left atrium, the way the way the heart sits. So. Um, if it's coming, you're going to see what we call a biphasic P wave in V1 most of the time. It's usually coming up and then going down because you're going to see the right atrial wave and then the left atrial wave. That's how you see it. All right, so sinus rhythm. Okay. And I said the heart it's about 80 beats a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a QRS for every P wave, right? Okay. It's one to one relationship. And the best leads to look for P waves are lead 2 and lead V1 most of the time. Okay, so one of these leads is what you want to look for. Um, for these uh, relationships. And sometimes, most EKGs, you will have a rhythm strip on the bottom. It's usually lead V1 and lead 2. That's how the, our machines are programmed in the hospital. So those are pretty good leads to look for your relationship if you want to look at it. Okay. Would that, would that not be considered some lead, some in lead three, would that not be considered some SD depression? Okay, so would you, so, uh, so, so, so look at, look at, look at the, look at the leads in, 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 in a group and let's talk about it. So, so you think there's ST depression in lead three? Okay. Like what else? Well, I was so so three goes with what? Three. So it'll be two, three, and ABF, right? Yeah, it so like ST depression there. So what are you thinking about when you see ST depression in the inferior leads? Any of you can speak up. It just doesn't have to be her. So when you're seeing ST depression in the inferior leads, what are you thinking about? There's an inferior MI, So so you cannot call an MI by looking at depression. So let me. So if you have ST elevation. You can call an MI in that wall. But if it's ST depression in the inferior leads, you cannot call it inferior MI. Elevation is the only thing that you can call for that wall. Depression just means ischemia most of the time, unless not associated as a reciprocal change. Sometimes all you will see is depression, you won't see any elevation, then that means ischemia. So could that be like a history of the ischemia then? Uh, it can be as long as it's not a it's not a reciprocal change. Right. So if you have two, three ABF, if you have depression, what are you thinking about elevation? One and ABL. So then you look at one and ABL and see, are you worried about ST elevation there? Okay? So it, it looks like there's some tombstoning and ST elevation in one and ABL. So you're not going to call this inferior ST inferior MI because this is not an inferior MI. The changes that you're seeing in this inferior leads is because of that reciprocal change in the lateral leads. The MI is actually happening in the lateral wall. Okay, well, what else do you see? Moving over to B1 and B3, I'm still seeing a lot of elevation. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing ST elevation in V1, V2, V3, maybe even V4, right? And maybe a YQRS there. YQRS in V5. And we'll talk about that. So V1, V2, V3, V4 would be what? V1, V2, V3, V4 would be what? So it's septal. Septal and anterior. So anteroseptal and then some hilateral. So, so if you think of the LAD, when it comes off, it gives the septal range first. Okay, so here's your septal MI. Then it gives off the diagonal branch that goes up into the lateral wall. Okay, and then it goes into the anterior wall. So it's some, it's a proximal LED occlusion. That's why you're getting a stale elevation in the anterior septum and the high lateral wall. And say again. And ABI. And ABI. Again, you don't want to talk about ABR as stale elevation when you have other as other other segments that have a stale elevation. If ABR is all by itself, then it's okay. You don't want to call this left main because there's ST elevation in the other chamber. So it's going to show some ST elevation because it kind of looks at every lead um, or every segment. So you're going to see some ST elevation in the ER. If there's anterior MI, inferior MI, doesn't matter. You're going to see some ST elevation. Um, but ABR is something you look at all by itself if there's nothing else in any of the leads. So this is an anteroseptal lateral ST elevation MI. OK? 
Okay, what would you do for the patient? Oh, we talked about why QRS. Why do you think the QRS is why? When do you get a white QRS? When the electrical system is affected, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think of the electrical system of the heart, you got the sinus node, you got the AV node, and you got electrical wires that go from the sinus node to the AV node. Then you have the Hispokinji system, which comes off of the AV node and divides into the right bundle and the left bundle. That Hispokinji system and the bundle sit inside the septum, in the, in the interventricular septum. When you have a septal MI, when the septal myocardium is getting infected, you're going to see some ischemia to these electrical conduction systems as well. So you're going to see some delay in activation of the ventricles just because there's ischemia in those bundles, because the septum is affected. So the QRS is just wide most of the time because of that um, ischemia. Sometimes they can have underlying bundle branches. Right? That's it for this one. What would you do? Two words. Yeah, you, would, um, you would call the cardiology nurse, get them an aspirin, you know, and activate the cath lab. <coughs> now, what would you worry about somebody who has that kind of an MI? You want to put them on oxygen right away because very high chance they would go into uh, pulmonary edema. You want to put pads on them because very, very easy for them to go to be in the rest. Um, so the main things on the floor is you, if, if you get handed an EKG or somebody has chest pain and you are standing there, the tech comes and does an EKG and hands it over to you and you see this. You go in, you know, tell the core it is to activate the, the call the cardiology nurse. You can call that cath lab, you can activate the cath lab and then put some oxygen on, put the defibrillator pads on them. You don't need to wait and give them some aspirin. Give them, you know, have them choose some aspirin. All right. All right, who wants to go next? This gets worse as we go along. Somebody, come on. You think you like it? Just look at me. I'm supposed to be looking at you. Hey, Paul. I love it too. Thank you. All right. So, you can do it. I'm going to hide over here. I'll walk with you. So, do you see PVs? That is obvious. I'm going to put it that way. Do you see PVs? Yes. Now, my job is to look for PVs. That's all I do. But do you see obvious PVs? Right, just two. Not very clear, right? So you have no, 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 really. I, I see it's like immediately what I thought would be way. Right. Now they're not. They're not. Harder. They're not. Like yeah. Yeah. So D2 is your rhythm forward. strip. You don't see. There's your QRS and there's your T wave, right? And you really don't obviously see a P wave. Now, I'll tell you where the P wave is later, but you don't obviously see a P wave. So, not really, sound, not really a. Not really sound, it's not sinus rhythm. rhythm for sure. Okay, what's the rate? Let's look at this. Look at somewhere where it comes closer to the lines. It's easier, that's how we do it. So, that's about 300, maybe 150. Okay? Yeah. Right there, perfect. So, 300, 150, is that right? Yes. Three? All right. So, 150 beats a minute. So, the, so, when you, so, you have a tachycardia, right? Yes. You have a tachycardia that's going at 150 beats a minute. So the, when you have a tachycardia that goes 150 beats a minute, the first thing you look, is it regular or is it irregular? Mm -hmm. It's a very regular, regular tachycardia. Okay, so that's the first thing you look at. The next thing, is the QRS narrow, is it wide? Narrow. So it's a narrow complex tachycardia at 150 beats a minute with no evident knee base. As far as I'm concerned, if you if you call it that much, that's all it is. <coughs> but, you know, it's, it's a, so, so once you see that, what do you move on? So that's all, that's all you can say from this. Now, it's, it's our job to say more diagnosis and stuff about AVNRT, things like that, which nobody's expected to make a diagnosis of that sort. All you have to say is it's a narrow complex tachycardia with no obvious P waves at a, at a rate of 150 beats a minute. Okay? Now, if I were to say P waves, what I would say is the P waves are right behind the QRS. That's what I call those P waves. But that's because I know exactly what this guy had. Uh, but that that you you're not expected to call those people. It's, see, it is true. I know. It's, it's, it's right there. It's right after that QRS. Um, but if you have a patient that says you know he doesn't he's getting short short winded, so you got for an EKG. Patients in this rhythm, okay? Your EKG tech is there. What would you what would you do? The patient's not feeling. Blood pressure is like seventy over fifty. Of course, you're calling for you know calling for your help, but. What are we gonna do for this patient? What are we gonna try to give? What, what? He's 82 years old. Say again? You can try to tell him to 
do vagal maneuver, okay? You can try to, and we'll talk about what, what, what those vagal maneuvers do, but what else would you do? Adenosine, okay? Adenosine, okay. Now, here's what we're going to talk about adenosine. So, would you do a, a so if it was an 18 year old in the hospital and did this, what else would you do before adenosine? What else could you do? You could, you could massage the carotid, right? You could massage the carotid sinus and, and that, can, that can terminate the technique because both vagal maneuvers and carotid sinus massage Pretty much what it does is it activates the vagus nerve and, and kind of inhibits that AV node. Most of these narrow tachycardias, these narrow complex tachycardias, are dependent on a pathway inside the AV node. And I'll put it this way, they're dependent on the AV node. So what anything, of the adenosine, the carotid massage, the vagal maneuvers, all of these things do is they inhibit the AV node. They block the AV node. That's all they do. They're not fixing the tachycardia. They just block the AV node for that one or two seconds, and all that's all it takes because when you talk about these tachycardias, they, they are in a circuit. They're, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a circuit. When you go, when you look at these maps in the <laughs> Lipila, they go round and round and round. So they have to, every every cycle, they have to go through the AV node for that tachycardia to happen. Okay, ninety-five percent of these narrow complex tachycardias need the AV node for them to happen. So if you even block the AV node for one or two seconds, one or two seconds is this much time. This is six seconds, right? So the tachycardia will break because every cycle needs that AV node. All you have to do is stop it for that one beat and it won't happen again. It will stop. Now it can restart. It can restart if the patient still has a trigger for it, but it will stop. And most of them usually just don't restart right away. They just break. Um, so what you're trying to do is block that AV node for that few seconds. And that's why we use adenosine because it's a very short acting drug. Now, I said 18 year old versus 81 year old. Why would you not do a carotid massage on an 81 year old? You worry about stroke because they could have carotid artery stenosis and you really don't want to take that chance of auscultating their neck and stuff because they could have equal bruise and you don't want to mess with the carotids in an older person period. It's not worth it. Um, younger people, different story. You can, you can do carotid massage. You can have them splash a little ice cold water on their face, put a very cold rag. And it's not like taking a cold rag and just slowly rubbing it. Set. It's that sudden cold rag on the face that, you know, that jolt that, that stops, the, that actually inhibits the heart for a second. That's exactly what you're doing. It's, it's not the cold rag or anything. It's that sudden, you know, sudden jolt that you get um, out of it. Um, so, so adenosine. Let's talk about how we give adenosine. So what would you do? How would you, how would you set up for adenosine? You know you're going to have to give adenosine in this person. So, say again? Get a crash card. Very good. Get a crash card. Do not ever, ever give adenosine without a crash card in, in, in the room. You don't have to hook up the patient, but you have to have a crash card that the defibrillator that works in the room before you give adenosine. Um, and we'll go over by later. So you get the crash card in the room. What else? Safe. You have to have a vital side machine. You do not let the EKG tech go. It's the key. You don't want to let them, because they'll give that EKG to you and they'll walk away. You do not let the EKG tech go. They have to go back, hook up that EKG, and they have to they have to run a rhythm strip while you give the EKG. The defibrillator strip is not enough. You cannot make a diagnosis with the defibrillator strip. It's one strip. When we go back and give, talk to this patient about a procedure later, we have no clue because you have one strip. I can't make any diagnosis with one strip. I know it's an out of complex cardiac. I didn't need the defibrillator strip to tell me that. So it's important that the rhythm strip is run on the on, on the EKG while the adenosine is being given. Okay? And and so you have the EKG tag go back and hook up the EKG. What else do you need for the adenosine? What's important? I told you the half-life of the adenosine yeah. is three seconds behind. Yes, four 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 so it has to be the closest to the bomb, closest to the, the heart. It doesn't have to be a big line or anything, but Anticubital or bump is what you want to try to. Now, I know about heart access. If somebody's got a really hard access and you don't have an IV, I get it. But if you have an IV that's closer to the heart, that's what you want to use. You want to have, a, ideally, you want to have a three-way stop bump, a two-way stop bump. Right? You want to have a, a big saline flush ready on one end, the adenosine on the other side. Now, most people, you can start with six, then go to 12. Sometimes we'll just give 12. What else? So you're ready to give the adenosine. Okay, go over the so the head resident gets up there, says he's gonna give we're gonna give it to Alright. So you know this patient, he's never met this person, okay? You got the adenosine ready, you're gonna give twelve. That's what they decide they're gonna do. 
you got 12 on one, you got the flush ready on the other port. So what you do is you turn your port, open your port to the head and see, push the thing, turn the port the other way and push the flush. It's one tip, it's got to go quick because if it takes longer for the head and to get the heart, it is not going to work because by the time it gets there, it's done, the half life's done. So it's, it's that strong, it's got to be one big, big push. It's got to get, and that's what the flush is for, to get it up there very quickly because otherwise sometimes you, and I, I, I see these where the IVs are here and there's a long tubing to the IV and you'll get to the other end of the tubing and you're, you're getting it there. I'm saying, it doesn't work because it will stay in the tubing and it will be done by the time. You can run a, run a you know, I've seen people run like a fluid bowl or something that. It doesn't work, it's gone. You have to be at there, right there, push, push. It's got to get up to the heart right away. How would you know it worked? Forget the breaking of the tachycardia. Maybe the tachycardia didn't touch the tachycardia. It was not a tachycardia that, that the adenosine was going to work. How would you know the adenosine got to the heart? The patient will know. What did you do? So you want to tell the patient before you push that drug. That, uh, who are the physician is not going to probably say, because they're just in their own little walk. But you have to tell the patient, you are going to feel like somebody hit you in the chest. Because it, it is a terrible feeling to get, get adenosine. It's truly terrible when you feel like your heart just sinks in. That's what they feel because it feels like somebody just like just held their heart and just hold, held it in place. So you have to tell the patient that they're going to feel terrible for a few seconds and it'll pass because it only lasts for like three seconds. Time. Time. They don't feel it so, uh, so you give that you give that adenosine, and then when you're ready to give that adenosine is when you tell the EKG tag run a rhythm strip, not a 12 minute EKG, because that's what they always do. They have the 12 lead ready. You run a rhythm strip, is what you do. You run the rhythm strip when you're pushing that adenosine so they don't kill the paper. And then when the patient feels it, almost 95% of the time, because the adenosine works on the AV node, it blocks the AV node, and the tachycardia will break. And you want to capture that on the EKG, and then they can come off. Now, if you, if you give adenosine, and if it's not a tachycardia that depend, is dependent on the AV node, you are, we will still get a diagnosis. Now, you might not cure the rhythm, but you will still get a diagnosis sometimes, you know, because the adenosine will cause heart block, but it will still come back. You will see a long pause and it'll come back because it only lasts for like three seconds and they'll cough and it'll just come back. It's not, it's not anything you have to really worry about. The tachycardia might come back, but at least the person who gave the adenosine will have a diagnosis of why the tachycardia came back and what we need to do with it. And why do, you, why do you have to have a crash heart? Let's talk about it. Are you ever worried about heart block? Is that why you have the crash card? Is that why you have crash card? You worry about heart block? So it didn't seem only lasts for three seconds. So it's not going to cause heart block. My cause heart block for three seconds. A three second pause is not going to do anything to anybody. And for while they're lying in bed, you know, it's, it could cause you know, you know, dizzy spells if you're standing up. But most of these people are you know, hooked up. They're lying in bed when you're giving it And whatever heart block it does causes is going to go away in three seconds. So why do you have a heart block? What would they have a system? It's only for a second. They'll come back. They will come back. Because they had a rhythm before. They will come back. They didn't see. See, these drugs, they have, they have a, 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 a short heart life, which means the drug is gone. The heart, it's, there's nothing inhibiting the heart at that point. It is going to kick back in. I mean, it's well, what's the come one back. thing, the, the main reason why you have the heart, why you have the... I mean, if it's going to come back, but who knows what rhythm it's going to come back in. It's exactly back the in. point. It, it will come back, but you don't know what rhythm it's going to come back in. Because in a very few percent of people who actually... So so if this is, a say, an 18-year-old, okay, who's never been in the hospital before, never had an EKG before, he, he came for, uh, what did it come for, tonsil or something. They don't get an EKG. Okay? They don't have an EKG on the chart. They came for some procedure, or they were as a family with somebody. You hook up this, there's this rhythm. You give it an NSE. And if they had WPW or both Parkinson White syndrome, was their underlying diagnosis, okay? They can present with this rhythm. This is not a fatal rhythm, but the minute you give them an NSE, it blocks their vena, and that pathway will take over. So they will, the tachycardia will break, but then what they come back with is VF. So you don't want to be that person that pushed a drug that caused VF in an 18-year-old and did not have, well, you're not ready to resuscitate it. It's okay to cause VF in an 18-year-old. You made the diagnosis. You will save that child eventually. But you want to be ready to take care of what you caused. You know, he's going to go into VF. You just have to shock him out of it. 
you will eventually, you know, because somebody will make the diagnosis and there's, there's, there's a theory to it. So, so, you know, what you don't want to have is you don't want to be standing there giving adenosine to this 18 year old. Okay? They're in VF and you don't have a defibrillator. You're running for a defibrillator at that point. You don't want to be that person because that is terrible. But if you're ready, you have paddles on. You, sh you shock them, they come back. And that's, you know, and then they get their WPW fixed and they're happy at it. But you don't want to be that person giving that adenosine and causing a VF in an 18 year old and they're down for too long while you're trying to fetch a defibrillator. So always have, you don't even have to put patches because all you need is paddles and put them on and chop them and they'll be done. But this is an 18 year old heart, it'll come up. But you want to be ready. And that's why you have the crutch card. Not for heart block, not for assistance. Those uh, defibrillators really don't work for assistance and heart block. So we have to get too far away. Alright, right, who's next? Anybody? So these are two. These are your two major rhythm leads. Okay, this is an additional one. So first thing, do you see pavings? Yes. Okay. So there are definitely pavings, right? Mm -hmm. And then the question is, is the sun? So the P waves positive in loop B two, three, and ABF. So they are positive. They are positive in one and ABL, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not sinus rhythm, right? Now what's what's a right? So I'm going to ask you one question. I'm going to ask you. Is there, a, is, there one, is there a QRS for every P wave? No. You don't, want, you don't have a QRS for every P wave? Okay. So, okay. So, where are the P waves that you see? So I'm going to tell you something about T waves now. So usual T waves, okay, they are very smooth structures. You never have dips and curves in T waves. T waves are smooth waves. You're either up or you're down. They're very smooth. Um, go back one kg. Really, now I have one nice kg for sure. Okay. See how the, the T waves are supposed to be. They're smooth waves. See that? They're usually very smooth waves. Now, so if you look at this one, there's nothing smooth about these T waves, right? So when you don't, when you have this double notching, is what we call it, these double notched uh, T waves, there's something hidden in there, always. So, so don't call. I mean, this is this is a little more obvious one, but don't worry about this one. That's artifact. I'm just going to tell you right now. What, what that, those, those things are just artifacts. So here's a P wave, here's a P wave. See that sometimes, all you see is that. So that's, that's your P waves right there. Okay? I'm going to march it out for you. Um, so there's not a P wave for every QRS. Okay? So there's some kind of wrong. Right? So a little bit, that's where we're going to start off. So there's more P waves, less QRS. Okay? So there's more P waves, which means there's more firing in the atrium, less firing in the ventricles. So there has to be some block in the in the AV node area, right? So there's some kind of heart block. Now the question is, what kind of heart block? So then you look and say, what's your PR interval when you have when you when you when you go to a QRS? Is there is that PR interval almost the same? It is almost the same, right? It's almost the same. So this this is a little more harder one. So I'm going to say the PR interval is, is the same. So what can it be? So what kind? Of, what let's talk about heart block. So there's type one, right? What's type one? A longer PR. That's all it is. All you but you're not going to have anything. It's not really a block if you think about it because nothing's getting blocked. It's just so that's all. So it's type one heart block, but I just I would call it just prolonged PR. Interval. 
Okay, that's what it's first degree AV law. Um, so you're not going to have more P waves than QRS. So it's not first degree. So then you got two. Tab two. Tab two A is what? Is your Venkibok, right? What's Venkibok? So, so as you get every P wave that comes and hits the AV node, the PR gets longer and longer and longer, and then it then it blocks the P wave. And then what's the key feature about Venkibok? I'll bring it back the next time when I come in, but so when it blocks, when it comes back, it's going to be a short PR. That's that's a key. So if you look at the PR interval after the block, so there's going to be a P, a P, QRS, and then it gets PR gets longer, P, QRS. PR gets even longer, P, QRS. And then a P and nothing's going to be there, right? And then there's going to be a P and a QRS. And that PR interval is going to be shorter than the one before. That's the key to make it up. I won't go over an EKG later at some point, but um, so this one you really can't say that because there's a PQRS, there's a P that blocks, there's a PQRS, there's a P that blocks. You really don't know whether it's getting longer or anything. So what would you call this? Safety. There's two P waves for one QRS. It's two to one heart block. Okay? You really cannot say what kind of what kind of type two it is. It's just a type two heart block. It can be A or B, depending on where the problem is. If the problem is in the AV node, it's type 2A. If the problem is in the Hispokin gene, it's type 2B, which is more it's long. So if you have somebody who's in 2 to 1 heart block, what, what are you worried about? Are you worried? Would you would you <clears throat> put pads on this person and start raising them if they're in 2 to 1 heart block? What is the one kind of 2 to 1 heart block that you worry about the most? If their QRS is wide, if their QRS is wide, those are the ones that could go into complete heart block very quickly. If they have a narrow QRS in that 2 to 1 heart block, they have time. They usually won't just go into complete heart block right in front of your eyes most of the time. So you have time to call, you know, cardiology, even if it's like a night consult and the physician only sees them. They'll do fine most of the time. You probably want to keep them on bed rest, so you want to don't push it too much. But other than that, you don't have to worry about it. But if that QRS is wide, that tells you there's disease even in the bottom. So it's just a matter of time before they, they will go into complete heart block. And the problem would be that they would go into complete heart block and they would not have a rhythm. And that's where the problem comes. This person, even if they go into complete heart block, they might have a junctional escape or something. So they're not just going to assist on you. Whereas if it's a wider QRS, they can have, they can just assist on you. Okay? Irregularly irregular. That's right. It's irregular. There's no pattern to it, right? So what kind of rhythm do you see where you don't see P waves and it's irregularly irregular? Say it. You said it. AFib. AFib. Yeah. So atrial fibrillation is the rhythm where you have no P waves and it's an irregularly irregular rhythm. Okay? So that's your rhythm. That's why I said you never go for the obvious because otherwise you will miss them. You will not see it. There's obvious things in there, but you never go for the obvious first. You go step by step. So this is atrial fibrillation with the rapid, what's a, what's a ventricular rate? Pretty fast, right? Pretty fast. So atrial fibrillation with the, with the rapid ventricular rate, right? Okay. What else? So you can't really do a whole lot of intervals in this one. What, what is, now, now let's move on. Let's talk about ST settings for sake of time. What's obvious? So patient is having uh, near syncopal spells. They, they just got up to the bathroom and just felt really lightheaded and sat down because it's just very nauseous and don't feel good. And they feel like they're going to throw up. They might have come in for chest pain, so they decide you're going to get an EKG. And here's the EKG that gets handed to you. Yeah, so 
we're going to start with what leads, STs. So what, what leads are we looking at first? Start with the inferior leads, always, it's easy. So 2, 3 and ABF, right? 2, 3, ABF. What do you say? ST elevation. See it? It's pretty, it's pretty elevated ST. So ST elevation in 2, 3 and ABF. If you have ST elevation in 2, 3 ABF, where are you looking for? What other leads are you looking for? Lateral leads, which is 1 and ABL. What would you see in the 1 and ABL? Depression. depression. You see depression. Yes. So yes. there you go. So those are your reciprocal changes. Are you going to say the patient has ST elevation in inferior leads and ST depression in lateral leads? No. We just have to say, what is this? This is inferior ST elevation in mind. This goes just along with it. You don't have to say, uh, you're not making any additional diagnosis with that. That just goes along with it. Okay? That's just an electrical finding on the EKG. It has nothing to do with the lateral work. Okay? So this is an inferior ST elevation in mind. Now, when you have inferior ST elevation, what other wall of the heart goes with the inferior wall? Posterior. When you have posterior ST elevation, where do you see leak problems? What do you see on your EKG? Depression and dissection. Say Depression and Depression in V1, V2, V3. So when you have inferior ST elevation, you want to look at V1, V2, V3 to see if there's ST depression. Is there ST depression? So there's infero, posterior ST elevation and MI with atrial fibrillation and rapid ventricular rate. That's your diagnosis. Now what else is there? One more thing. One more lead. All by itself. Right there. Okay? You see that? Until here you were seeing some depression stuff. Did you see that? It's a little bit of lateral, but even if you miss that, it's not a big deal. But there is infrared posterior lateral is what it is. Because V6 is all the way out there. So when you get that inferior and posterior, you just get a tip of it. Because that PLV branch, the posterior lateral ventricular branch is what's occluded. That's why you're getting a little bit of that lateral. So you look at the EKG, they know where to go shoot the first shot. Because, you know, it's all about door to balloon time. So you want to get that vessel first. So you know exactly which vessel to shoot the angiogram first. That's why it's important for us to know where the, where the MI is. So this is an infra posterior posterior lateral MI. What would you worry? What, why is this patient in a fit? Why do you think this patient is in a fit? They came in sound I'm going to say that. What what uh, supplies the infra posterior wall most of the time? The right coronary. Okay. The right coronary supplies the inferior wall most of the time. You can get the circumflex to do it too. But when the right coronary supplies the inferior wall, you have an inferior MI. The right coronary also supplies ranges to the atrium. So when you have a proximal occlusion in the right, right coronary, that atrial branch is also occluded. So you get atrial ischemia. You go, and people who have atrial ischemia can sometimes go into atrial fibrillation. And that's why this portion went into atrial fibrillation because it's a proximal right coronary you know, occlusion and they went into atrial fibrillation because of that. You don't want them to have a stress test with the AFib going like that when they're having an MI. So very important, the patient is hemodynamically unstable, very important to get the patient back in sinus rhythm or slow them down very quickly. Uh, the only thing you have to worry about is not slowing them down too, too quickly or dropping their blood pressure because what else gets affected with inferior wall MI? I said the right coronary. What else is the right coronary supply? So it supplies the right atrium, it supplies what else? The right ventricle. Okay, so it goes through the right atrium, go through the right ventricle, and then get to the left ventricle. So let me let me make one thing clear. When I say inferior MI, when I say anterior MI, posterior MI, I'm not talking about the entire heart. We're talking about just the left ventricle. We're not talking about the right ventricle at all. So when I say inferior wall MI, it's the inferior wall of the left ventricle. We're talking about anterior wall of the left ventricle. We're talking about posterior wall of the left ventricle. We're not talking about the right ventricle at all. The right ventricular MI is an entity all by itself. Okay? And when you have right coronary or inferior MI, you want to worry about some of the, there could be right ventricular ischemia. If you have right ventricular ischemia, if you drop their pressure too much, too, and these people, if they have right ventricular MI, they're usually hypotensive. And that's one time that you don't want to give them nitroglycerin. Because most MIs, if they have chest pain, that's what you would do. So you would give them nitroglycerin. But if they are hypertensive, then you're worried about they're having an MI, it's an inferior MI and they are hypotensive and they're very nauseated and things like that, you want to worry about right ventricular MI and you don't want to give them um, natural glycerin. What you want to give them is what? 
fluids. 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 One one MI, you want to pump fluids because the right ventricle is very dependent on fluids. You want to pump in, you want to open a saline band. You're not worried about them going, going into pulmonary edema. Anterior MI, you're worried about them going into pulmonary edema. You don't want to give them fluids. Inferior MI, where you know where they are hypotensive, you want to give them fluids. Anterior MI, if they're hypotensive, it could be from just LV dysfunction. You don't you don't treat it with fluids. It's very important. If it's anterior MI, hypotensive, most likely because their EF has dropped, they're pretty sick, LV, heart failure, that kind of stuff. Inferior MI, they are hypotensive, most likely because they have right ventricle and MI. So you want to give them fluids. So you open up fluids, you don't give them nitro, if they have pain, you can give them morphine and, and stuff like that. What does that mean? It's going Sorry. away. It's going away from the inferior lead. So it's coming from bottom up. So it's coming from the atrium because it's a P wave. But it's coming from the bottom of the right atrium and going up instead of the sinus node fire. So this person does not have sinus rhythm. They have a P wave, but that's not a sinus P wave. It's a, it's a, so it's coming from somewhere else in the atrium. That's in the low in the hop. Okay? So what do you call this? This is an ectopic atrial rhythm. Because it's in the atrium, but it's from an ectopic site. It's a different site other than the sinus site. So it's an ectopic atrial rhythm. This person most likely has what? They probably have sick sinus syndrome. Their sinus nodes are not working. That's probably why they have this ectopic atrial rhythm. Now, if this was faster, it would be ectopic atrial tachycardia. Okay? But this is not fast. This is 300 or 60. So 60 beats a minute. It's just a regular rhythm. Normally, at this rate, a sinus node should have worked. The reason why this is working is because the sinus node is not even working at 60 beats a minute. That's why this is working. So the way the heart works, when the sinus node stops working, some of the site in the atrium will try to take over. Some ectopic site will try to take over. And when that stops working, then the junction will start to take over. So there's the hierarchy in how, they, how, how things take over. So usual ectopic atrial rhythms are around 50, 60. So that's when the sinus node doesn't work, that's when your ectopic atrial sites usually take over. Or sometimes when you have the jobs and toxicity and things like that. But at this low of a rate, it's because the sun's not working. So the, just saying that this is an ectopic atrial rhythm tells you this portion sinus node is either not working or we have done something to it. Either with medications or whatnot. So what else is in here? So ectopic atrial rhythm, right? You can't really talk about PR intervals because PR interval is a, a, an entity where you're talking from the sinus node to the AV node. But it's not even coming from the sinus node. Who cares what the PR is? It could be rusty coming from the atrium right next to the AV node, and the PR will be short, so you really don't care about it. So what are the intervals? <coughs> QRF, narrow? Yeah. Okay, what is the next interval? QT, right? What does that look like? Pretty long, isn't it? So the QT interval is very long in this patient. See that? That's a pretty darn, see that? It's much longer than half of that R up. So if your QT interval is longer than half of the RR interval, okay, that means your QT is long. So what do you think, what do you think is going on with this patient? Probably giving him too much drug, some kind of, some kind of AP drug is probably what it is. Either Zordalol or Amiodrome or Ticacin, one of those drugs that prolong the QT or uh, a small chance at something with the electrolytes, but mostly something like a bear of something that has slowed them enough that the sinus node stopped working, that the ectopic atrial site had to start working, and that QT has gotten pretty long. Okay, so usually you want to look at the medication list and kind of hold off. You don't want to call this, you don't want to call the sinus rhythm and give them their bear blocker that night. That's okay. This is not sinus rhythm. That's why it's important because if they have an ectopic atrial rhythm, Probably not a good idea to give them better blocker because that will shut down too. Okay. Oh, 
obviously the patient wasn't feeling good. I will do this, we'll stop at this one. So. All right, who wants to go? Group five. Sinus or not? Yeah, it's going to go group. Sinus or not? You see P base? All right. So positive P base, right? And then ferrulates. Positive, it's hard to say, but positive in leaf one. So sinus rhythm. Okay. Is there a QRS for every P wave? No. No. Okay. So, so you really can't talk about PR intervals or anything like that. Is there any relationship no. between the P and the QRS? No. no. Okay. So the so so when, so there's really there's is there more P waves, more QRS? So hard, easy to say, hard to say. I definitely can say there's around here, right? There's more P waves than QRS. One here, one here, it's probably one in there, one here. <coughs> right? So four P waves, one QRS. So more P waves, less QRS. So heart block. Still is the rhythm regular or irregular? Is that is that all our interval regular or regular? It's very regular. Okay? So you have some kind of heart block, okay? And the RR interval, there's more more P waves than QRS. Are you getting it right? So there's hard block, there's more P waves than QRS, and the RR intervals are regular. <coughs> kind of hard block. There's only one kind. Third degree. Third degree. Period. So if there is more P waves than QRS and the RR intervals are regular, there is no connection between the atrium and the ventricle. The ventricle is firing by itself, and that's why it's regular. The atrium is firing by itself, the ventricle is firing by itself. It's complete hard block. If there's any connection in type 1 and type 2, type 3 is your complete heart block, right? Type 1 and type 2, there's some something that's going along. This block in between, but at least one or two go, along, go, up, go out in the ventricle. So there's going to be some relationship between the A and the B. So it's not going to be regular in the bottom. Okay, it's not going to be regular in the bottom, except for one time, 2 to 1. You can, I'm not saying, I said more P waves than QRS, and, but it's not 2 to 1. 2 to 1 is going to be regular. But if it's not 2 to 1, you know this is not 2 to 1 because we know from here that it's not 2 to 1. So if the, v, if the ventricle beats by itself, atrium beats by itself, and the ventricular rate is regular, it is complete heart block. Okay? So sinus rhythm, right? That makes sense? Sinus rhythm with complete heart block. Yeah. See why both happen simultaneous? It's sinus rhythm, but there's complete heart block. Okay? What else? Let's talk about what needs first. <coughs> three, 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 right? Two, three, and a What do you say? Elevation. Elevation. elevation and then fair leads. What else do you see with us? The elevation and then fair leads. Depression. Depression. Depression and one and a which is the lateral leads. Do you see depression? Yes. So, so what is this? Inferior. Inferior ST elevation and mark, right? It's nothing to do with that lateral walk. Remember that. Do not call it lateral and mark. Do not call it infralateral and mark. It's not infralateral and mark. The lateral wall is ST depression. You cannot call an MI from an depression. You can only call an MI with an elevation. So, inferior ST elevation MI. What else goes with inferior? One, two, three. When you have inferior MI, what are the walls that you're looking posterior. for? Posterior. 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 What do you look for posterior? One, three. You want to be three. You see what do you say? Depression. There's really only one beat per lead, so you've got to go with one beat. So, ST depression. Mm -hmm. So, what is this? If you have ST depression in B1, B2, B3, that means you have ST elevation in the back. So this is inferior posterior as the elevation of mark. Okay, what else is there? Do you see anything else? Nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> so posterior as the elevation of mark. What else? Why is this patient in heart block? The reason why, remember the first thing I said, don't go for the obvious. Because what would you see in the CKG? The first thing you'd see is that inferior and mark. You completely miss out on the heart block. If you don't go step by step. So that's why you have to go step by step. Uh, and then you won't miss it. Uh, because you don't want to miss the heart block part because by your transporting is when they're going to have the, the nice on pass and, and they won't make it after that. So why do you think this patient has heart block? Let's start with that. So <clears throat> what did I talk about? The, so in pro posterior MI, what, what artery are we talking most of the time? Most of the time. Right for so what is the right coronary supply? Comes out, <coughs> gives the atrial branches, gives the sinus node branches. So that last patient who had atrial fit, 
One of the reasons why they get AFib is one, atrial ischemia, two, because that artery that supplies the sinus nerve gets affected and they get, a, they get acute sinus nerve dysfunction and they can go to AFib. So anytime your sinus nerve doesn't work, all the other stuff can act up. And on top, when you have atrial ischemia and the sinus nerve not working, that's a perfect combination to have AFib. So you have sinus nerve artery, you have atrial branches, then you come along, then what, what's the next branch it gives? It gives an AV nodal branch. It gives a branch to the AV node. Then it goes into the right ventricle, gives off the right ventricular branches, then it goes into the left ventricle and supplies inferior and posterior wall. That's how the right coronary goes. So if you have a proximal right coronary occlusion, the AV nodal artery gets, gets affected. And when the AV nodal artery gets blocked up or doesn't have supply, you can complete heart block. So very common for inferior mice to have complete heart block. Does this person need a pacemaker? Does this person need a pacemaker? Yes. So this person ideally should not need a pacemaker. The reason is why, you, te temporarily they might, because you know, say if you are, there's a long transport period, we might put a temporary wire in there. But almost 90% of the time, the minute you open up that right coronary, that complete heart block will go away. Almost 90% of the time. And if it doesn't go away that acutely, depending on say if they were down for like too long, then we would put a temporary wire, we wait 48 hours for that AV node to recover, because that AV node has a 99% chance that it will recover after that coronary is fixed, if it's fixed timely. So the reason why we know it's timely is because of what? You don't see what waves in here. What tells you it's late? So I told you ST elevation means injury. There's actual injury happening right now. <coughs> ST depression means ischemia. So there's some amount of ischemia that's set in. What tells you about infarction? Infarction means dead tissue. What tells you about infarction? What Q waves. Q waves. So you're supposed to have a Q wave here, right? If you had so if that inferior wall was dead, you would have seen a huge Q wave. So sometimes you'll see Dr. Chana saying it's too late, he's already queued up. That's what he's made. Because it's, it's it was late, because the patient already has developed Q waves, which means they have had a full blown infarct at that point. So you might or might not be able to recover that heart muscle at that point. And those, you know, will keep the temporary wire for 48 hours. But like some of these, like we would open the right and wouldn't even put a temporary because the heart block's not going to come back because we got it so quick. Okay? And usually you will not put a pacemaker in anybody that had an MI for that first 48 hours. You cannot because it's considered to be legal because there is a 99% chance they will recover. That's why when these people get stents and they have like pauses or blocks, we say we can't do a pacemaker for 48 hours just because we can't. All right, we'll stop at that. Thank you.